We're going to follow the same format we have the last two days, so we'll dispense with the song. And Brother Ken Chumley is going to lead us in prayer, and then uh, I'll come up and begin the proceedings. Brother Ken? Shall we pray? Our gracious God and Father, we thank Thee for this time that we were able to be together this week. We thank You, Father, for the elders, for this congregation, for Brother David, for the work that they do in the preparation of this lectureship. We thank you, Father, for those who have spoken on the lectureship. We pray, Father, that much good might be accomplished as a result of the efforts that have been put forth today and throughout this week. Father, we pray now as we enter into this time of open forum that we might be able to discuss questions that would be of interest and of good study for those who are here to help us, that we might walk in the light as he is in the light, that we might be able to stand fast and to stand firm and contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Father, we pray that you would forgive us wherein we fall short of your will. And Father, we pray that you would strengthen us in our efforts. We pray for those who are listening to these lectures throughout through the internet and we pray that you would bless them. Father, particularly we would ask for Brother Tim Smith that you would continue to bless and strengthen him in his daily struggles. For in the name of the Christ we do ask and amen. I would like to begin today uh, under the direction of the elders to read uh, this comment regarding The Rodriguez brothers. Just a second. I had to get a thing lined up here so I made sure I had it right. Uh, as to why the Rodriguez family is not here today. And this, as I say, I mean directed by the elders to read because uh, they abused their involvement in the open forum but not willing to abide by the rules that set out. And they were asked not to come back today. I've also been asked to say this regarding the elders' position concerning the charges brought against Brother Lynn Parker. That the elders say that there is no substance, neither is there any credibility to those charges made against Brother Lynn Parker. And that's the position that they wanted me to announce. And as far as I'm concerned, I say a hearty amen to both of them. You know, one thing about a lectureship or anything else a certain private organization puts on, religious or otherwise, and then they invite the public to come, <clears throat> the public needs to understand, when I say the public, I mean anyone who's not a member of whatever that organization is, religious or otherwise. And when they're there, they're expected to abide by uh, the rules and regulations. And if they can't do that, they ought not come. I remember a number of years ago when trouble was going on at Harding College because there were teachers there, or at least one, and I know there were more. I'm thinking right now of 1969 and the trouble over Dr. James Atterbury, which some of you will remember, that it was pointed out that no teacher should ever accept work in a college, especially a private college, unless they were willing to abide by the policies that govern that college. That they should not take a job in such an institution with the intent to change those policies when they got in there relative to what such colleges as Harding and other institutions of that nature were expected or were set up to be. And would that not be the case if I came into your home under your invitation? Would I be expected to treat you like some unworthy whatever. And so it is, though I'm sure there'll be some denials of this, that that should be the way it would be with you, with me, and with anybody else, wherever we would go relative to our respect for the people whose home or business or whatever the institution might be that we were in. And I think we all need to keep that in mind. That's just very important. Now, moving from that, 
I want to touch on a couple of things here. First of all, we have this uh, that needs to be taken care of. And this uh, came over the uh, internet for a question, or a question to us. And the statement made before the question, I need to read so uh, we'll know what the question really is all about. Uh, I have a question for you concerning yesterday's open forum. Windows Media, Media Player is saying that it is copyrighted. 2007 by Spring CFTF, and yet one of the elders, 45 minutes and 23 seconds to the broadcast yesterday, stated specifically that it is not copyrighted. Is he correct? Are we indeed free to download it? Well, I was completely unaware of that being on there, and I'm sure he was too, and there's, we found that there's a reason that, that there is, and I looked into it. Brother Bruce mentioned a couple of years ago about OABS pulling the plug on us at a very inconvenient time, not really giving us much time to do anything, so we jumped in a hurry, and we were able, due to earlier connections, to get um, out over the Internet through another company. Well, OABS was copyrighted. And so when that got moved over, OABS was taken out and uh, the uh, uh, CFTF was put in to take care of whatever that was. And notice it does say 2007. It does not say 2008. That's just a carryover. Here's the answer. It has been removed. So the oversight has been corrected. And it stands, as Brother Cohen said the other day, you're free to download it. Now, on those that are already archived, if you go into those that are already archived, that copyright will still be on there, but it is uh, it makes no difference. And since we're the ones who put the copyright on it, we can say it makes no difference. So it makes no difference. <laughs> and uh, that was just an oversight. And if uh, things hadn't been pulled the way they were pulled, that might not have been had to be that way anyway. But it's uh, nevertheless, it's off of there now. So feel free to uh, download what you need and use it. And I trust those who do so. We'll use it as is and in context. Uh, we hope that's the way it would be. So I hope that takes care of that. Now, I would like for the fellows who would, and we have the first question down here in just a moment, but uh, we'll wait on that, if you will, just for a minute. I want to deal with one thing that was said yesterday. Last year in the um, uh, paper Contending for the Faith in the February edition, and it was referred to yesterday under an editorial I wrote that I called a medley of matters because I dealt with various things. This is where that I was supposed to have misrepresented them. I'm going to read a little bit here, and I'm going to point something out to you. And it'll further prove, um, when I say them, the Rodriguez brothers, uh, it'll further prove just how people can pick at certain things, but they may have opened up a can of worms they will not be able to close. I wrote... Joseph Metter met recently for about three hours with at least two young preachers. Notice I say with at least two young preachers. I didn't limit it to that, but I knew there were at least two young preachers. In that meeting, he sought to justify his practice of gestalt therapy. I want you to remember what they said. You see if I misrepresent them. In that meeting, he sought to justify his practice of gestalt therapy and possibly some of his other beliefs and activities as the advertisement on the front page of this CFTF reveals. He informed those in the meeting that he did not believe or practice those parts of Gestalt therapy that are contrary to the Bible. Didn't they say that's what he said? Okay. He also gave them a printed statement to explain said matters, but he told those who received his statement that they could not give said statement to anyone else. Now, they say he didn't say that. Who did they say decided it couldn't be given to anybody else? They did, didn't they? So the only thing I have to change here is this. He also gave them a printed statement to explain said matters. But the Rodriguez brothers told those who received his statement that they could not give said statement to anyone else. Isn't that what they said? I wonder why they wanted to do that. We never did find that out, did we? So is it not strange that Meta wrote a statement designed to put him in a good light and silence his critics, but it's not for everyone? Is there anything wrong with that? Regarding the intent and purpose of said statement, does it remind anyone of another statement produced in September of 2005, Dave Miller's statement? Anything wrong with that? It, too, was written to set straight the record about Miller. Anything wrong with that statement? However, about the only thing said document turned out to be was an example of how to equivocate. I used that very word yesterday when I referred to 
what Dave Miller preached and what the congregation did on the basis of his preaching, and then what this statement of September 2005 said when you compare and contrast them. That's exactly what it said. Now, comes now a matter now limiting the circulation of his statement of explanation to those whom he thinks he has already personally persuaded to agree with him. Well, now the only thing I have to change there is, comes now the Rodriguez brothers and decide that this has no business being circulated. So we correct that. We're glad to announce. Joseph Meadow didn't do it. They took it upon themselves not to circulate it, except to show it to you, except then later to read it, which wasn't dispensing it, but when you read it, you can then transcribe it. It gets back on paper. It can be dispensed, and they're happy. <laughs> I'm glad they were happy about one thing. Um, so I say, what is there about Miller, Metter, and certain others a like attitude that motivate them to act contrary to Paul's statement regarding his teaching? Well, I could have added Rodriguez brothers in there now, I understand. Paul wrote, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, 2 Corinthians 3.12. But we must not forget that to be understood is to be found out. Paul did not mind being found out regarding what he preached, and that's not scriptures. Paul wrote, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. That's not scripture. Then here's another place I would need to change it. If matter is speaking and writing sound speech, it cannot be condemned, Titus 2 8. Why does he desire his explanation and position statement to have a selective distri distribution? Well, let me ask that of them. If matter is speaking and writing sound speech, it cannot be condemned. Why do the Rodriguez brothers desire his explanation and position statement to have a selective distribution? So a lot of good it does to change it from what they said didn't happen, that is, that he didn't restrict it, over to the fact of what they said did happen. They decided not to do it. Well, why? Why wouldn't they want to be known since that was a clarification statement regarding that he received criticism on? So I don't know what, what you would do about that uh, except to do it there. Now, that's been corrected. We know for a fact the Rodriguez brothers are the ones who heard the explanation of Joseph Meadow, took it upon themselves per their own comments, and said, you can only read this if you drive to Beeville to read it. Until now, after the fact, Joseph pulled his stunt that evidently he was pulling even then when he wrote this. And now it's all right, I say again, to read it, get it transcribed, and distribute it, and that's okay. Brother, somebody needs to learn something about implication. Right. Now, let's move from that. And, yes, sir. Well, come, don't, we can't get you unless you come up here. I know it's... As the years pass, it's harder to make those strolls, but you'll just have to come up anyway. <laughs> Devin McClish. Devin McClish. More precisely, it's the Rodriguez brothers and father, isn't it? Don't know that he was there. Okay. I didn't understand that. Somebody else may have understood that they, that they said his father, uh, their father was with them. Okay. Yeah, his name is on it, isn't it? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, we don't want to leave him out. Well, I didn't either. That's why I wanted him. Okay, the Rodriguez, I mean, however, however many of them there are, uh, you know, I suppose one spoke for the others the other day. If they'd had just one sign, he could have written for all of them then. Anybody that's of the Rodriguez family that was there in that office with Joseph, we want them to know that they are the ones that chose to restrict that the way they restricted it until they unrestricted it so it could get, well, we want to get back to Etc. 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 Ad infinitum. Ad nauseum. Yes, sir. Uh, Brother Brown, I have a two-fold question, and I'm glad to know because you already told me that we're switching to another subject. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, man psyche. How much responsibility does man have to understand God's will? How much responsibility does God, and I'll refer basically to Ephesians, the third chapter, uh, where the Apostle Paul stated 
in verses 3 and 4, Now that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In the same chapter, in verses 16 and 17, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Some suggest that the Holy Spirit, in a supernatural way, uh, communicates with our psyche uh, after we obey the gospel. I would love to hear your explanation of this. Well, I'll be glad to give an explanation of it. Others may want to also, but I'll be, be glad to do what I can on it. I think it's first of all obvious that Paul, when he wrote the letter of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, thought that the Ephesian brethren, when they read what he wrote, they would know what he knew relative to the subject that he covered. Then, when he comes down and talks about uh, the uh, matter of being strengthened with the might by spirit in inner man, I think there's something we need to realize that sometimes gets overlooked relative to these um, statements in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit was definitely working miraculously through the apostles at that time, and also, because they had all of the nine gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, they also were able to put those gifts, as we all know, in uh, to the churches through the laying on of their hands because they didn't have a written down completed New Testament. In fact, Paul's writing part of it. He writes the Ephesians letter. It's the same to me as when I look over here, and Pentecostals have tried this on us in debate, when we would uh, point out the design and the end of miracles and usually affirm a proposition uh, they had something to do with the miracles ended by the end of the first century, and they would try to say they're still going on. And they'd say, see, uh, you claim elders in the church. So you go over here to uh, James 5, and you read in verse 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is, he, is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And immediately he turns right around and says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual perfect prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And, they, and keep this in mind, because I'm going back to what you asked about. And they will say, See, you folks have elders. Don't you believe in prayer? Of course, we'll say yes. Well, do you do what James said when you get sick? And I say, I'm not going to call the elders when I get sick. I'm calling the doctor. And that's exactly right, because that set in the time of miraculous gifts. Those things have passed away. But the abiding truth relative to prayer is still with us to this day. Now, over here, and this is where the parallel, as I see it, comes. In uh, Ephesians 3, when he says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inward man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded so on. I know that there, is, there was a miraculous faith. One of the gifts that came to the laying on of the apostles' hand, the miraculous gifts, was the miraculous gift of faith. Well, when that miraculous gift ceased, the way faith normally comes didn't cease. But for the infant church, what do we mean by infant church? They didn't have what we had. Paul never held a completed New Testament in his hand. He yearned for the day that he could. Well, then what does it mean? He gave this direction to the church in Ephesus, thus to all the churches of that time. And in effect, I think he's very well saying that you have these miraculous gifts, because remember what he's about to go into in Ephesians 4. He gave gifts unto men. And he tells some of them, which is a parallel passage, 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, uh, where he's discussing uh, the abuse and misuse of miraculous gifts. And in so doing, he tells us the design and purpose of them for the church in lieu of the um, incompleted New Testament. And I think all you've got in Ephesians 3 is that the Spirit did do things with them directly that he does not do with us. But we still walk by faith and not by sight. It's just not through a miraculous gift of faith. I think you have the same thing personally in James chapter 1, uh, where 
you have in verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall, get, uh, it shall be given him. Now, this is one of the passages that Mac also uses to say, now, if the Holy Spirit personally indwells in you, then one of the things he does directly to you is give you something that you can't get through your own human powers as you study the Bible. He's going to give you this wisdom when you recognize the Spirit's there to do that, working directly on you, and thus with such faith you ask God to do what he said he would do here. So that's, that's a, still the same type of passage as you've got over here. So I think the Spirit still strengthens us today by his um, might in the inward man, but doesn't do it miraculously like I think he did with those people. Look at what the apostles had to go through. Have you ever just really sat down and contemplated the terrible things they underwent for the cause of Christ? How did they bear up? How did they bear up? Well, you have uh, where there was miraculous intervention. When Paul is going on his uh, trip to uh, Rome, why, how could he be so um, peaceful in the midst of that storm? Well, there was an angel who stood by him. He gave him insight that told him what? There won't be a soul lost on this ship if you'll stay in the ship. So Paul got up and told him, no problem here. Well, you look at your, it just looked around at you, that hurricane they were in, you'd think there was a problem. Paul had that extra power, and that was in the church in the way the apostles had the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, but also through the miraculous gifts. Remember, Paul told Timothy, do not neglect that gift, which means those gifts could be used by their own willpower. Thus, when they had one, and I don't know whether this is the best way to describe it, they could turn it off or on. That is, they could use it. Well, how do you know that? Because he said, don't neglect it, which means if you had it, it was used as you will to use it. So this, to me, says that they had those gifts in the Corinthian church, they had them in all the churches, and thus when they were used properly, who was strengthened? By his might in the inner man. Who was strengthened? Those who employed and exercised the gifts as God intended. Today the Holy Spirit still converts people to Christ. Before that he convicts them of sin. The Holy Spirit made me a Christian, and he keeps me faithful. The question is, how does he do it? through the sword of the Spirit that's the Word of God. Now the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, piercing you the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. So preach the Word. So these gifts, I think we have to recognize when you read these passages like you brought out, I think we have to recognize that they were given at a time when those gifts were very much there and expected to be used as God intended them. Thus, when they were abused as they were in the church at Corinth, they couldn't accomplish what God intended them to, to, to accomplish, which was to strengthen the church. Think about it. Why were they there since they didn't have a complete New Testament? To strengthen them, to help them live the Christian life. I appreciate that. I have a uh, follow-up question. Uh, I have come across some who challenge men's ability as rationale to reason uh, unless the scripture specifically makes a statement. In other words, uh, is there a place for deduction? Uh, we conclude instrumental music is unscriptural. Uh, we don't find specifically in the scripture, thou shalt not use instrumental music. So uh, what I'm asking to help me out to better explain uh, how man's rationale is involved. Well, first of all, if you're going to go by what I understand, whoever said this was, unless it's explicitly stated, a thou shalt or thou shalt not, then we have no right to teach it as God's will that we must obey. All right, where do they find that thing? <laughs> it's not there. So they, it's sort of like saying, uh, never say never. Or you can't know absolute truth, but are you absolutely sure? So they've come up with a thou shalt, which they can't find in the Bible. Which thou shalt says thou shalt use only thou shalt and thou shalt not, but they can't find their thou shalt 
to say we should only use thou shalt or thou shalt not. <laughs> a bit absurd, isn't it? Well, how would they determine how many people who are Christians, and I've asked this so many times, it's my favorite illustration, regarding man's rational power. And we always talk about on any given subject, take all of what the Bible teaches on it in its proper context before you begin to reason with it to draw a conclusion about it. That's just the way we work. So there has to be some induction before there can be deduction. You gather it all up. You do the searching. That's one of the wonders of, of, of uh, concordances, isn't it? That's one of the great blessings of it. Now with the Internet and all of a sudden you're on a computer, you can really get to town on it. But once you pull it all together, let's say like the word baptism, and you look at it, that's how we can learn there are more than one kind of baptism is because we look at all of the places where it is. And uh, therefore, you start reasoning with it. Well, take Paul, for example. Uh, in the process of Saul of Tarsus becoming a Christian, did he repent of his sins? Did he? Okay. Where, in just so many words, explicitly, does it say that Saul of Tarsus, in the process of becoming a Christian, repented of his sins? Acts 17, 30 and 31 is commanded all men everywhere to repent. Well, you're answering your own question then, aren't you? <laughs> because if he's a man and he commands all men everywhere to repent, then Saul of Tarsus what, did what? At least one thing we know in the process of becoming a Christian. He repented. Now there's a place of deduction and a reasoning. You cannot know that Saul of Tarsus repented of his sins except it is by implication. So the only way the Bible does teach is explicitly and implicitly, except that we have a lot of folks who just don't recognize the implicit part of it, and yet it's there. How, how do, I can ask anybody today, and this is another favorite, uh, how do you know this Bible is for David Brown or for Brother Mallory, Doug Mallory today? How do you know it's addressed to you? Does it have your name in it, your address, your social security number? No. Well, how do you know? Implication. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. Paul said to Timothy, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Or if I'm a Christian and I'm faithful, to whom does the Bible apply? There's another way you can do it. You see like the, the, um, uh, the, the um, church in Corinth. It's addressed not just to the Lord's church in Corinth, but to the church of God in order to all those everywhere that call on the name of the Lord. Well, are you somebody that's a Christian and it applies to you? So there's all sorts of ways. Those are just very quick things we can bring up. But that's the place of man's rational powers in inducing and then deducting and then drawing a conclusion based upon the evidence. Thanks, I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. That's a good study. Can't study that too much in my judgment. Well, here he comes again, walking the green mile. That was Dub Mallory. I'm Dub McClish still. <clears throat> Another good passage on uh, universal implication of the gospel is Matthew 28, verse 20. Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world, as long as you're preaching the gospel, making disciples, baptizing them, etc. I want to give a maybe a little different view on Ephesians chapter 3. I don't disagree with what uh, David has said in uh, his exposition of being strengthened in the inner man. I've always liked to turn immediately to what is our sixth chapter of Ephesians, where Paul explains, beginning in chapter 6, what that strength involves. Surely we understand he's not talking about strengthening the outer man, when he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then begins the uh, whole armor of God discussion. And each one of these, ending in verse 17, with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. But each one of these elements of our spiritual armament is involved, or involves the word of God. That is the source of our strength. Then I'd like to turn to Colossians chapter 1, from the same author, of course, beginning with verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray and make request for you that ye may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, 
to walk worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory, unto all patience and long suffering with joy. Admittedly, there was strength in a direct way for various ones in the first century from the Holy Spirit. But there was also strength for the inner man through the Word of God, and that was from the Holy Spirit too. I don't dispute that at all. I just say both of them were there at the same time uh, working. It's a very difficult thing for me to know in view of the infant stage of the church and the design and purpose of miracles, whether it's through the apostles or through those that had their hands, uh, that their hands were laid on and the miraculous gifts that existed, because it's obvious they did things for them that they couldn't do for themselves, that was special and temporary and provisional. And yet at the same time, you'll remember that I virtually joined with you on that and said, here is the Word of God that is for us today. Well, of course, it was for them then, too. And uh, even with those miracles being worked for the good of their own faith, it's obvious that uh, that uh, they still had the obligation to stay. So there was some things they did for them, other things they didn't. Um, I don't know why that, that passage at all has to be twisted to say that this must mean a direct operation of the Spirit at us at all times in the church, even after the miracle's over with, to impart either wisdom or whatever. Uh, Mac takes the position that we do all we can with our strength to do only what's authorized, but then there are those times when that's insufficient. And thus, if we're laboring under a burden and we pray for God's strength, then he gives us strength beyond our human strength, which strength is based upon our knowledge of the Bible and our efforts to do only what's authorized. Well, if that's the case, it ought to be borne out. The fruit in their lives ought to indicate it. And, and to be blunt about it, relative to Mac and where he now preaches, the Spirit failed him at that case because he sure couldn't see some skullduggery that was done up there that never was straightened out that people that didn't need the direct work of the Spirit could see was being done. And that's, that's one of the problems that there is. And if I were debating them, there'd be a lot of this stuff hung around their neck. Because if they have something extra special, the proof of it ought to be in the lives they, that they conduct that should elevate them above the rest of us. Another interesting thing about Mac, though, is he said if you've never been taught this because you haven't had the opportunity of the direct work of the Spirit as he teaches it, it's going to work anyway. Think about that a little bit. Do you have something to say? I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Am I following the rules? As far as I know. I'm uh, Buddy Roth with Spring Church of Christ. Uh, in light of the, the turmoil that uh, centers around Brother Dave Miller, I'm sure you have, uh, or reasonably sure you have, and I know that I have been challenged with the, with the universal challenge, have you talked to him? I'd be curious to know in this audience, and I'm sure we can't get a uh, exact count, but how many conversations, either those of you who are in the audience or that you specifically know of, how many times Brother Miller has been approached to discuss this problem with R and R and NMDR? Well, I just have to. Yeah. What well, I know. I know our brother Ken has. Well, let's hold your hands yeah. a minute. Let me count. Okay. Two here for Two sure. Here. And, and we had one here yesterday. Yes, Brother well, Jeff Lipke. That's three. Now, those of you who know of others, okay? Okay. And Michael? Paul Brantley. That's right. How many is that? I lost count. I think that's we're at six or seven now, right? Yeah. Right. That's right. Okay. Yes, that's right. Yes, right. You did that too, Gary Summers. Right. Yeah, Gary. Okay. And see, we don't know all a lot of it, but there's right here you can come up with specifics rather quickly okay. of ten or so. All right. That 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 said, I, I think you know where I'm I'm going with this because that that defeats that argument that nobody has approached the man. And uh, uh, in my own personal case, I have. Uh, 
uh, made the decision not to uh, for one reason, but I think there are men who are much more capable of logically approaching him than I, and I see that there that has happened. So I don't feel like I'm derelict in my duty by trying to contact the man. Well, I think you're exactly right. I haven't tried to contact him directly, but neither have I tried uh, before debating the Catholics to contact the Pope. <laughs> Bruce Stolting, Ming Dawson, preacher and elder from Huntsville, Texas. Uh, you know, back when the Crossroads movement was big, started down in Florida, that was their thing. Have you been there? Have you seen it? Have you checked it out? I don't have to go to hell to speak out against Satan. Okay? There's credible testimony, volumes that condemn his own self from his own words. Uh, it's, it's not always necessary for every individual that wants to speak out against an error to go face the lion in his den. There are those that have, and the evidence is there, if people would just look at it. Okay? And that's what we need to do. We need to get beyond this petty nonsense and say, well, have you talked to them? I, you know, it's not necessary for all of us to do that. Just consider the evidence and reach the conclusion that's demanded by the evidence. Well, I doubt he has the time to talk with us for two and a half years all day long and still try to figure out what he's talking about. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Bruce. Uh, Wayne Blake from uh, Pichetra Road. I, I want to make a statement about why I contacted I didn't do it for this liberal misapplication of Matthew 18. I didn't do Amen. it for that reason. I did it specifically because I sent out a mass email to several people that I have a lot of respect for, and I asked them, are there specific things you'd like to ask him? Some clarifications, something you'd like to ask him, and that's why I contacted him. I didn't contact for any other reason. I already had in my mind and my understanding of hearing from other credible witnesses and hearing from his own words that what he had already said, he was already convicted. So I want to clarify that. That wasn't my reason for calling it because the man, uh, you know, but I got clarification on some things because the word had gone across the wide plains that he repented in that letter he sent out. And he said in no uncertain terms, that is a declaration. It was not a letter of repentance. And so anybody holding to that, that is a lie. And that is from Dave Miller himself. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, for the Danny. Uh, Danny Douglas from Dresden, Tennessee. Uh, Brother Brown, I'd just like maybe for you to comment on this. Next week, the Faulkner University will have their lectureship, the Faulkner Lectures, and I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole line up of who's on there. It states uh, Gary Bradley. I'm not sure if he's Gary Bradley from Mayfair or not. But uh, Mac Lyon, Flip Newell, Brandon Renfro, Glenn Colley, Jack P. Lewis, and Eric Lyons, and Jim Bill McIntyre, a 21st century Christian, promoter of Ruble Shelley literature. Uh, Brother Brad Harrow wrote a guest editorial in Sleep the Old Paths that came out in the February issue condemning Randy Lowry, president of Lipscomb University, for being a guest speaker at the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity, January 19 to 25, 2008, at Second Presbyterian Church in Nashville. And I couldn't disagree with what he says regarding Lipscomb and President Lowry. Uh, going back to the Tahoe family encampment of 2004, uh, Gary Bradley of Mayfair, Truett Adair of Sunset, 
Tex Williams and Brad Harrow and Burt Jones of Moundsville, West Virginia. I'm not reading all the speakers, just a few. I don't have the speakers of 2005, but I've got 2006 here are some of the speakers at Tahoe again. Randy Lowry, mentioned in Brother Harrow's article, Glenn Colley, Truett Adair, Tex Williams, Gary Bradley of Mayfair again. Uh, Gary Bradley, that will be at Faulkner, uh, will be speaking during the week, three or four mornings. And um, we know that Bradley, if this is the same Bradley that's, that spoke at Tahoe with Brother Harrod and others, that Mayfair is a major promoter of the change agent movement and has been for many years. What's the difference between Faulkner and Lipscomb? Now I know that there is some difference. Faulkner is not as far down the line of liberalism. But are they both not on the same slippery slope? Like you comment on that and the consistency or inconsistency regarding these comments. And by the way, Mayfair participates in Winterfest with Jeff Walling and is on their website for this year it is promoting youth in action at David Lipscomb University, no less. So, could you comment or somebody? Well, various ones can comment, but it, it is totally inconsistent. And if you're going to appear with one of them one place in peace and harmony, then you're going to be the same at the other place. It's, it's all just a matter of this stuff that's becoming more apparent among certain ones that's a, one time were considered quite sound, and now seemingly if you just continue to preach what you've always preached, you can go ahead and do something completely different, which difference is that you're now fellowshipping these people as if they are right where you are. And that's what's come out of this whole thing. I don't know that uh, you can say much about it. Can you imagine if you just change the names of certain ones that are listed in the New Testament? Uh, with sound brethren coupled in with those that are noted, as has been said earlier today, not to be sound. Hamiletus or Hamiletus and Alexander, Diotrephes, having them all on lectureship. But there's Paul and there's Luke and there's John on the same lectureship. It just doesn't sound quite sound right, does it? Uh, and yet, why doesn't it sound right? Because of what people believe and what they practice. There's why it doesn't sound right. I don't know how to say it otherwise. It's just simply not such a conglomeration is a practice of a form of sectarianism within the church that ignores the authority of the Bible on the second John nine verses following. That's just all it does. It just completely sets it aside. Really, what else could be could be said, at least in a few moments, it's just simply inconsistent with the doctrine of Jesus Christ and what we're authorized to do and who we're authorized to do it with. And well, we don't have authority to do it. If I'm not mistaken, in uh, one of the Tahoe programs, maybe 2006, uh, Brother Glenn Colley and Brother Gary Bradley were on the same program. Can someone uh, help me with that? Isn't that so? <laughs> if it is the Gary Bradley from Mayfair in Huntsville, well, again, uh, Glenn Colley preaches for the West Huntsville Church, and I believe he's on record saying that he has no fellowship in Huntsville, Alabama with Gary Bradley, but he can go to Lake Tahoe and speak on the same program with it. Now, that shows how ridiculous the, uh, the fellowship uh, issue has become. Which means they could go ahead and swap pulpits there or one appear at the same time the other. What's the difference? If they were consistent. Now, I do understand that Gary Bradley backed out for some reason of that Lake Tahoe program that year, but the principle's the same. My brother colleague was going to go on professing his uh, conservatism while speaking with a man who was so liberal in his own city he could not fellowship him in his city, but he could out of state. And um, then you have Truett Adair brought in, the head of Sunset, whatever they call it now, some kind of institute, I think, 
and you have uh, the Southside Church in Lubbock being brought in because uh, Brother Brad Harab went out and spoke with Truett Adair at Lake Tahoe and then came within the next short time and spoke at the Lubbock lectures that same year. Tommy Hicks, director of the Lubbock lectures, is well known to be an opponent of Sunset, though he is a graduate of the same, and well, rightly time, so. In times past he has Yes. Been. But uh, now uh, he might as well have Truett Adair on the Lubbock lectures as having someone who has no problem speaking on the same program with Truett Adair. And that's only one problem with those who have been invited to Lubbock lectures in the last couple of years. But it just shows how the ripples of this thing continue to flow and to embrace more and more and a wider and wider scope of those that would not have been considered by some of our brethren we thought were sound and faithful just two or three years ago. Absolutely, and amen. Who's next? I'm not sure. Skip. I mentioned uh, Monday quite a bit of information about the West Kentucky lectures, and particularly Keith Moser's statements there where he referred to us as vile and liars as well as uh, Brother Cates, who stood on that same dais and at the time made that statement about, well, we don't believe in Elder R&R &R as it's practiced by the liberals. And of course, that qualifying statement somehow implies that it's okay when it's practiced by conservatives. Glenn Colley was at that same location and was one of the speakers who stood up in response to the same question along with B.J. Clark, who was also there. It was, it was kind of interesting to me because it seemed like Glenn Colley's only comment that he could make was, I hate the devil, don't you? And I don't know what that was supposed to mean, but the implication that he, he gave was somehow or other that all this division was being caused by us rather than by Dave Miller and those that associate with him. I'll also mention that Glenn Colley is a regular speaker at the Polishing the Pulpit program. And by regular, I mean he's been there every year that I've even heard of the program. He was there when Dave Miller was on the program a couple of years ago. He was there when Phil Sanders was on the program a couple of years ago. I personally wrote both of the, the, the key directors, the founders of that program, about Dave Miller before they had him on the program when it was announced he was coming on the program. And I wrote them six months ahead about Phil Sanders and that and the things that Phil Sanders practices, including Children's Church, the fact that he advertises Lads to Leaders, Churches of Christ Disaster Relief, and that he made the statement that was some of which was related uh, at, at this lectureship at the uh, for, for the Christian Chronicle, that the Christian church members were his brethren. I gave all this information to Alan Webster and Eddie Gilpin six months ahead. I'll mention that uh, I was told by Alan Webster at the time we would discuss this at our next meeting. I personally met Eddie Gilpin in August, a month before polishing the pulpit, and I asked him about this information, what they had discussed. His response was, well, I'll have to talk to Phil at PTP. So with six months advance notice, they could not discuss these things with Phil Sanders in six months. Do they know the Rodriguez brothers? Well, I don't know. I don't know if they do. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they never said et cetera to them. Uh, but, but Glenn Colley is a regular participant in this, in this program and seems to have no problem with, with, with getting involved with any of these brethren. Uh, 
But his participation at Lake Tahoe, again, his big response to that was, why, I wrote a book about change agents. He did write a book. It's a good little pamphlet that he wrote. But he's not practicing what's in the book. And let me say along that line, that's where the whole problem is. Not that this only hasn't been said, mm -hmm. but that's exactly where the problem is. If you were to bring them in to preach on fellowship, they would preach as good a sermon as you ever heard on fellowship. At least as far as I know, they would from what I've seen. But they're not going to practice it because they have adopted this viewpoint that we can determine some way or the other, whoever the we would be, what is significant error and what is not significant error as to what we should be concerned about and who we associate with. Now, that's what has come out of this. Uh, if it has, I don't know what's going on. But they've, they've, uh, they've done that. If writing a book is the only standard we're going to go by, then we ought to all be in fellowship with Max and Cato. Yep. <laughs> That's your brother Dan. Hmm. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, if anyone knows whether this is the same Gary Bradley or not, but all that aside, I think it was last year that Faulkner had Dr. Jack Evans Southwestern. And of course, he's well known for his error on divorce and remarriage. So that's why I wouldn't be shocked if they had uh, Gary Bradley this year. Uh, another thing I want to say, not all of these names that I mentioned necessarily teach over error. Some of them do. And I don't say these things to hurt these men. But I say that in love for them and for the brotherhood because... These men are in the public eye, men like Brad Harab and others that have an influence. And it needs to be known that not everything they're doing is correct. And so just because we see their name, although they may be considered sound by many people on a program, that doesn't make the program of the men they speak with sound in faith. So I say this out of concern for souls that might be misled by their example. That's the reason I want to bring this up and to warn people about the fault in their lectures. They're not sound. Thank you. Well, Brother Danny, this lectureship or any gospel meeting or anything we do here at Spring, and I think I can say this for all of those with various endeavors, uh, such as Michael Hatcher and the lectureship down at uh, Bellevue, it's all because we want the church to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on whatever subject it might be as well as uphold the defense of that and the exposure of any error that's out there. That people, because we love them, will know the truth. Because it's the truth that you set you free. And that would be the truth about error as well as the truth about truth. And so we all need to be mindful of that. It seems that nowadays we're seeing what some of us saw as young preachers uh, 35 years ago and longer that if you oppose anything, you just simply don't love them. You have something personally against the person. You're just trying specifically to hurt them. But if you raise your voice at all, that if you do anything like that, that you just have the wrong attitude. It may, I'm sure Brother Dove knows this, uh, Brother Dove McLeish, and possibly others, that Brother Woods, for a number of years in conducting the open forum at Freed Hardin, was under a great deal of attack because of the way he conducted it. And yet it was my favorite part of the day because you knew exactly what he meant when he got through with things and how he dealt with matters. And he could, as well as any mortal that I knew in my lifetime, cut through all of the red tape and get right down to the bone of the matter right quickly. And that's what some of them didn't like, and that's one thing they don't like about us. Well, I'd like to know, using great plainness of speech, why that's wrong. Paul seemed to think it was a good thing. The Holy Spirit inspired him to write those words. Behold, we use great plainness of speech. I don't know that that's the attitude of most of these people. Brother Michael. Michael Hatcher from Bellevue Congregation, an editor of Defender. And I say that because of the comments that uh, Brother Skip has made about Keith Mosier and his calling for using the terms vile and liars. We challenged Brother Mosier to produce any lies. And I will state that Brother Mosier wrote me. Uh, however, he did not try to produce 
or document any lies. I don't know if he wrote you because you, uh, David, had put it in Contending for the Faith as well. He did state, though, that he did not call us liars. Uh, I quoted what he said to him. He never responded to that. He did call us liars. What he said to me in that, when he said he did not call us liars, he said the attacks are to, that he did not call us vile, that he said that the attacks were vile. That's not what he said if you listen to the tape. He called us vile. Uh, but he did not try to document even one lie that supposedly has been written. Well, you know, if you teach at Memphis School of Preaching or like institutions, you can make charges all day long that it's proven. I mean, we can't hear that. <laughs> I, uh, the challenge is still open to Brother Mosier to produce and document the lies. Well, speaking as Edgar continues to the faith and the partner in owning it, wherever he was, I think he had to go to the airport. I can tell you right now, uh, we certainly say, show us. We have had, all the way back when Brother Rice started the paper, and it's still the same way, as, and I know it's true of, the defend, of Defender, if somebody can show us specifically where we have misrepresented something, we'll change it. In so far as I know, that's what we all have to do in everything we do. Is that not right? And I think we did that a little while ago right here, and it's going to be done even more. Except that I don't know what that changing a while ago, how it helped the Rodriguez's out very much. You again, huh? Uh-huh. Well, yeah, I'll take it. No, this is a special $5 bill. And, will it, and will, nobody it, spin, will it spin? That's all I want. It will spin here. You really have to have $5. I didn't say I have to have it. I, okay. I wanted it. <laughs> this one is special. Okay. You visit Bellevue Lectures in uh, Florida. I offered $100, and this is on account because I'm a poor preacher. This is all I can have up front. To anybody that will meet in public debate, someone representing the truth against someone representing the reaffirmation of elders. Okay, I know that there's been a challenge to Michael Hatcher and Daniel Denham. It has to be a public debate. Josh Day could collect that $100 to help pay his expenses if he will step up in a public debate. I still have that money, and it's still here in case he wants to clean it. Have you got, have you got 200 They can do it one time, I'll do it the other, and I'll take the second 100 <laughs> No. No, it has to be somebody representing their side. This is this is a serious challenge. I understand. I understand. And I think Brother Whitlock, when he was there, challenged them all he wanted. He, he offered a hundred dollars so anybody can produce a scripture that taught him. And he already spoke, spent most of the money in the book room before he left. So he was pretty <laughs> he was pretty confident that he wasn't going to get taken up on. It. Here, here's the thing with those people. This is one of those issues that to them is not important. And if we were really wise and learned brethren, it wouldn't be important to us either. That's exactly how they think about it. Wonder why, wonder why you have the account of the death of Nadab and Abihu and us. Why is that in the Bible? Those things are really insignificant sins from the way humans see things. But two, uh, three people died over it, and it was God that killed them, which is well thought out earlier. Who's next? Daniel Cole, Trail Creek, Soto, Kansas. Brother Brown, I've been teased a lot since I've been here about being sent back to Leavenworth. <laughs> well, you had to escape first, that admission uh, that you've drawn there. After I pose this, uh, you may give me a personal escort. But, but this goes back to your having introduced me to a young man last night over here about a post that I made regarding the 39th Street congregation in Independence. 
let me say this before I get to the point that I want to get at. 39th Street, where Jack Williams is, and where they have the lectureship there and have had for 30 years, I guess. And the Park Street congregation where Ted Thrasher is, is an enemy with which Trail Creek deals. Uh, when Brother Doug McClish held our meeting in October and into the first couple of days of November, is that right, Brother Doug? Uh, he doesn't remember well either. I want to speak up just a little bit. We were asked by one of the brethren of a sister congregation to invite Ted Thrasher and Jack Williams to the Trail Creek Gospel Meeting to help resolve some of the problems that deal with OABS and those things are all tied to it. I contacted Brother Dub and told him that that potential meeting may occur and try to prepare Brother Dub, not that he would need a lot of it before he arrived in Kansas City, the Lawrence area where our congregation is. I received not a breath of a response from Jack Williams, not a breath. I received a letter from, and I do have it, not with me, but I can make it available, from Ted Thrasher of the Park Street Congregation, whose response basically said this, before we do anything, the brethren there at the Trail Creek Congregation need to repent for having been withdrawn from. What Brother Ted didn't really put in that letter is that the Park Street Congregation, of which he is a part, Ted Thrasher, had already been withdrawn from before I ever arrived in Kansas. And I've said all that to say this. I made a post sometime back, you'll recall it, about the 39th Street Congregation and their ties to OABS. And I was asked for some proof of that. Brother Williams, I asked personally in August of 2006 as to why the elders at 39th Street removed Robert Taylor from that lectureship. The response that I received from Brother Williams was because he will not oppose Dave Miller. That's what Jack Williams told me. Uh, Denny Dernigan also, I believe, called him and asked him that question. I don't know if Denny's here or not. I think you are, but I think Denny asked him that as well. The tie between the 39th Street and OABS is this, brethren. They, even though they removed Robert Taylor from that lectureship, they still have Tom Bright, who publicizes on the internet that lectureship. They have Ted Thrasher as one of their speakers. And Brother Douglas, and I don't have it on this computer, I do have it, and I know that you have it according to what Danny Douglas told me, unless he lied. What do I have? A copy <laughs> of, I was getting to that, the financial report from OABS and a letter which Tom Bright wrote I have it. where there are praises sang to, to uh, about. about Robert Taylor and where that financial report shows that they have supported and paid monies to both Robert Taylor and Ted Thrasher, but yet 39th Street will have OABS as representative Ted Thrasher and Tom Bright on that lectureship. Folks, there's your tie, and David's got the email, and I've got the document to prove it. I, I, I had to say that because I have been asked a lot of questions, not only in private person email, but also last night about it. And again, it's the same kind of mixed up fellowship to where if you don't directly do it or you're not dealing directly with somebody that does whatever the error is, then you can fellowship those in the periphery. And I say, I, the reason I say that, that's what we as a small, small congregation, Trail Creek, of, of, of 11 people, we're fighting two opponents, and we got black eyes on both sides of us, one from 39th Street and one from Park Street, and we're trying to oppose this. Folks, we need some prayer, okay? We appreciate it. That's what we're doing. 
Now, Brother Danny, would, uh, am I correct? The, the material that you sent that he referred to is only about a month old, isn't it? December. December, okay. All right. So it's relatively new. There's nothing going back several years. It's relatively new. Yeah, it's contribution from Forest Hill to OABS. Okay. Contribution from Forest Hill, Irene Road, where the sponsor of the Memphis School of Preaching contributions to OABS. $200 is what they monthly Any other comments? Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. And Brother Buddy, you know, you asked a while ago if you were in line with everything. I, I didn't tell you then, but I can't tell you that now, though. I was going to say, if you weren't in line, I was going to sit Ken on you, <laughs> eyeball to eyeball. But he's gone now. He's gone. Uh, well, really, I, I have a comment to make. I'm kind of going to blame it on you. Okay. We, you're used to that sort of thing. But, I have uh, two days. We, we sometimes have our classes here, and I'll go up to David afterward, and I'll say, well, so-and-so. And he said, well, why didn't you say that? So I'm going to say it now. <laughs> okay. With the matter of the various errors that we see throughout the Brotherhood, whether it be MDR, R&R, &R, whatever, it occurs to me that there is an analogy there, and I would implore those who, who do not take the matter of fellowship with error seriously, would they please equate these various errors with typhoid, bubonic plague, smallpox? Where do you draw the lines of fellowship then? Folks, it doesn't stop at A. It goes A, B, C, D, E. And ask the Center for Disease Control sometime what problems it brings as it mushrooms. Well, that is the whole idea. Uh, concerning a little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. It's the same principle. I don't know how to say it. What, what are these people going to do about that principle? Little leaven, leaven the whole world. And what they're really doing by their example is simply saying to everybody else, just teach the truth right out there, but don't practice it. And all these younger preachers go down and do likewise. So what does it do to fellowship eventually, no matter how well you teach it? Besides being a hypocrite when you do that, it just destroys it. The walls will be brought down of the distinctiveness of the Lord's church. And some of us, as I said a while ago, remember well 35, 40 years ago where this thing was going on from the same situation and standpoint. It related basically to the colleges then and their efforts uh, because most preachers were then trained in colleges. They had tr training beyond uh, at least academic training that was going on in the colleges. They provided these preachers for the pulpit. So the pressure was put on those men from ACU or wherever it might be when they took stands against what went on in the college. It's not one bit of difference. And so you had all these people who really believed different things involved in the whole mess, and that's what it is. And there's nothing in proper unity about any of it. It's just a hodgepodge of whatever it is practicing unity and diversity. And I firmly believe this. He probably would never say so unless it would work for his own benefit. Rubel Shelley knows what's going on, I guarantee you, among, and he must be laughing down his sleeve at this. I guarantee you he recognizes exactly what's happening, and he knows what's being practiced now by people who opposed him strongly not long ago is the very thing he's been practicing for I don't know how many years. And he knows in time where it's going to lead them, right to where he now is, and all those others are occupied the same position. It cannot help but do so. It just can't do it. It's the way it works. It's already done it for them. These folks are just Johnny come lately. They're just behind them several years. That's all it is. We're about out of time. Any comment or so? If if not, forever hold your peace. <laughs> okay, we're dismissed.